Uh, my name is Leslie Hughes. I'm the president of Boquete Health and Hospice. I've been president, I'm starting my second year on that. Before I came down here, I was an EMT in White Plains, New York, which is just north of New York City. So some of these things are geared towards what to do in an emergency. Some things you can't handle on your own. You're just going to need to recognize that there's an issue and get someone to a doctor. Some things you can handle. But this is a, a situation where we want you to all realize, I've got a problem. Here's what I do about it. First thing you need to do is breathe. With an emergency, you tend to panic, you tend to stop thinking, and you tend to react uh, instinctively. If you breathe, you can realize that there's a problem, and we can then work on solving the problem. By the way, if you want a copy of this presentation on your, the sign-in sheet when you came in this morning, if you just put a note that you want a copy of the presentation, I'll be glad to make sure you get one. The second thing you want to do besides breathing is make sure it's safe. If your spouse is in the house and the house is burning, yes, it's great to go rescue your spouse, but not if you're going to give up your life at the same situation. If it's a car accident and the car's on its side, you want to make sure that the car is stable before you try and take someone out of the car. So just make sure that the, the scene is safe. If you've got them, gloves are a wonderful thing to have with you. Um, I keep a pack of in my car just because if I go to help someone and they're bleeding, I don't want to get their blood on me and I don't want to transmit any bacteria that may be on my hand into their wound. Wear a mask. Then determine, is the problem medical or traumatic? If it's medical, diabetic, heart attack, choking, something in that vein, get it to a doctor. There's very few things you can do for a medical issue. If it's traumatic, bleeding, a broken bone, something that has, a, a force that's acted on the body to create an issue, that is something you can maybe handle at home. And then start with what we call CAB. Determine whether it's a cardiac issue, because it doesn't matter if anything else if the heart isn't beating. Determine whether, if it is beating, determine whether there's an airway issue. Can the person get air to the lungs? Is there something blocking the airway? And then the last issue is breathing. Are they breathing too fast? Are they breathing too slow? Either one is bad. You want something between 16 and 20 breaths a minute. You determine all that, you figured out the majority of the problem and how to fix it. A very short thing. Blood goes round and round. Air goes in and out. Any deviations, not good, fix it. How do you know if it's a cardiac issue? Is there a pulse? You can feel it on your own wrist, right below where the thumb comes into the hand, or you can feel it with your jugular or carotid pulse. If you don't have a pulse, everything else is off the table. Call for an ambulance, start CPR, go from there. If the mouth is clear and they haven't been choking, then there should be no problem with the airway. If they've been eating or chewing gum or something, there could be a blockage in the airway perform the Heimlich maneuver and see if that helps anything. You may have to do it several times. Don't worry if you break a, a rib or two. Life is better than a rib. And then make sure your breathing is, is working well. We're going to look at four medical emergencies. I'm not going to worry about children in this case. We don't have too many children in our uh, particular community. Diabetes. There's high blood sugar and low blood sugar. Low blood sugar can happen whenever you've been exercising and haven't eaten enough, or you start working out and you haven't had breakfast, or you've been not paying particular attention to your uh, blood sugar over the course of a couple of days. It's a quick and almost uh, very short term medical emergency that happens. With this happening, 
you know your, your significant other is a diabetic and they start feeling dizzy. They start feeling disoriented. They don't know who they are or where they are or what's going on. They can't tell you what happened. It's probably low blood sugar. Give them juice. Give them honey. Give them a soda. Make sure it's not sugar-free, though. Work on getting their blood sugar up. It should improve if it's low blood sugar almost immediately. It's amazing how quickly the body will process the sugar. But get them to a doctor. A doctor will then monitor them for a longer period of time with a glucometer so that they will maintain a good sugar level. It won't go high and low and then back up and down again. It's something that you really need to pay attention to. If you've got someone in the family that's diabetic, there's glucose pills and, and chewable candies you can get that will get them the sugar they need in a hurry. If it's high blood sugar, they've been eating, haven't been taking their insulin. This is going to be a slow onset, but it's just as deadly. If they start having any of the symptoms of thirst, fatigue, their breath smells fruity, get them to a doctor. There's nothing you can do about this at home. Get them in the car, get to a doctor, get to one of the clinics, get to Dr. Diaz, Dr. Gomez, Dr. Boya. They can give them the insulin IV. It will solve a lot of the problems really quickly. Heart attacks and strokes. Both of these are time-sensitive issues. A stroke affects the brain. If it's a brain bleed, one of the, the vessels in the brain has, has had an incident, there's nothing you, both of these, there's really very little you can do at home. A brain bleed or a brain clot are both issues that can be life-threatening. A clot can actually destroy brain tissue. Usually you've got what they say is, is a golden uh, time hour. You've got 60 to 90 minutes to get this person to definitive care where they can be given a clot-busting uh, drug to break up the clot or give them uh, a drug that will create more blood, blood clotting antibodies in the brain. You need to get this person to care. You need to know when the, was the last time they were normal. Now, if we're talking 90 minutes at, at the outside and they were normal when they went to bed but you get up eight hours later, you don't know well, you know they were normal eight hours ago, but it's a lot longer time frame. If they were normal at breakfast and an hour later they're not normal, you know you've had an issue, get them to the doctor and say, 60 minutes ago or 70 minutes ago, whenever, they were fine. This will help the doctor determine what needs to be done. Symptoms for heart attacks. Women, we've got it lucky. We have a lot more symptoms than the men do. The si most symptoms that people know is nausea, arm pain, chest pain, shortness of breath. Anything like that, you need to go see the doctor quickly. Women, we also have fainting, indigestion, fatigue, things that might, in this, today's day and age, sound like the flu or the virus. So just because you're a woman, you go in with those three symptoms. Don't discount the fact that it may be a heart issue. Don't let the doctor talk you away from looking at those symptoms in that perspective. Same thing with stroke symptoms. Women, we've got a lot more symptoms than the men. Men have six, face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, vision problems, trouble walking or lack of coordination, and usually a severe headache, worse than any headache they have ever had. And on a scale of one to 10, it is a 10. But women, we also have general weakness, disorientation and confusion, fatigue, nausea and vomiting. Sounds a lot like the heart attack symptoms, right? 
Heart and brain are very interrelated. If you don't have one going well, the other's not going to work either. So you want to keep track and pay attention to how you feel and how you felt coming into whatever this crisis is. If you can say, I felt good until I started mowing the lawn, then I felt you know, shortness of breath and, and uh, dizziness, and I'm not diabetic, and now I feel like I'm going to throw up. What do you think it could be? Hello? Is there anyone out there? Heart attack or stroke. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Merle who's our treasurer for Boquete Health and Hospice. And he's going to talk about respiratory shortness of breath. Thanks, Leslie. I just uh, wanted to add a couple points to what Leslie had said. Um, one, the first one's a story, and maybe this will help you with regards to strokes. And that is, uh, I, I have over 40 years in the healthcare profession uh, respiratory therapist, taught respiratory, uh, was the director of pulmonary medicine in a hospital system in Colorado, uh, treated hundreds and hundreds of patients. Um, my wife and I had a dis difficult discussion one evening, and she got up and she walked off and she went into the bedroom. And I rumbled and didn't say much. And then I said, well, okay, I better go in and talk to her. So I walked in, and she's laying on the bed. And I start to say, well, you know, I think we need to talk about our dispute. And she just looks at me. And I said, well, you know, if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. And she just looks at me. And it took me a good almost 10 minutes to figure out the fact that she couldn't talk, that she was having a mild stroke. And um, it, it took me, I, you know, I'm a guy who was used to making decisions like this in the hospital. And it, it took me a good 10 minutes to get organized and to figure out that we needed to get her to our doctor and then down to the hospital. So the reason I tell you that story is it doesn't matter how much background you've got in healthcare, when your loved one is in trouble, it's good to have support, someone else you can get a hold of. So one of the things that we've done is we've developed a support line of people that we can call, like we can call Leslie, and Leslie's helped me with my wife in one other situation. Um, so that if we get into a situation like that, call for help right away. Now, the first thing to do is always call for help. And uh, it's important to have somebody else who can support you, even if you're really good at these sorts of problems and issues. So I just thought I'd share that with you. The other thing is, is that uh, in the, the case of uh, strokes and heart attacks, there's a very simple thing that you can have in your home that's highly effective, and that's cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper, the higher the hot factor that it is, the better. But if you take that sublingually, put it under your tongue when you have the symptoms like chest pains, um, or if you see an onset of a stroke coming on, it's a potent vasodilator. So it, it immediately, with it under the tongue, will, will cause your vessels to open up throughout the body. If you've got a partial blockage, it could be enough to keep blood flowing through that vessel until you can get to a hospital where they could administer streptokinase or some other... Uh, caught blessing, busting drug out there. So um, those two points. So talk about respiratory just a little bit. The, 
big thing about breathing problems is uh, you notice it because you're short of breath, right? And we get short of breath all the time. We have a tendency to ignore it. But it is also an indication of both short-term, long-term respiratory and cardiac problems. As Leslie mentioned, that these two systems, the heart and the lungs, are integrally linked together. And they help each other out when one of the two systems is what's called decompensating, or it's not working the way that it should. So um, as an example, when your blood oxygen level starts to drop, what's the first thing that happens? That in terms of a physiologic response, the Yeah, you'd think that you'd start breathing more. It's actually the heart. The heart speeds up first. It pumps more blood because it's saying, I'm not getting enough oxygen, let's pump more blood. And then you start to breathe more. So that, that's just an indication of how these two systems work together and how one can be an indicator for the other. So when we're talking about sudden onset of shortness of breath. There are several things that you can be aware of that will help you until you can seek out medical help. So what are some of the causes that we have? And we look at allergies and asthma is one thing. And we'll talk about that in terms of short-term and long-term reactions. So in short term, what happens is that um, you get into a new environment. If you already have a sensitivity to it, but you've got a lot of things now, like if you come from a rather desert climate and you come to Boquete, which is just filled with flowers and all sorts of plants and those sorts of things, trees everywhere, all of the different pollens and antigens that are out there can trigger asthma and can trigger uh, al allergic reactions that you maybe hadn't had in your entire life up to this point in time. But they can come out as a, a matter of just being in a high-density, pollen-rich environment. So that's one thing. If you start feeling tight in the chest and shortness of breath, it can be related to an asthmatic reaction. Uh, usually you have runny nose and itchy eyes and other things that go along with that, so those would be other indicators. Another problem is that if you're walking down Main Street and you get really short of breath, well, one thing could be whether am I going uphill or going downhill. We'll talk about altitude next, but uh, the other factor, which is probably more common, is the amount of diesel and gasoline fumes from the vehicles, particularly if it's a high traffic period. So if you have high traffic and you find yourself getting short of breath, get off Main Street. Go find one of the side streets, walk down there and see if you feel better, okay, which you can. Um, so that's, uh, again, a, a reaction of the airways to the chemicals that's in the air from the exhaust the, of the vehicles. The second thing I'd like to talk about is just change in altitude. So anybody know what the altitude is here? A thousand meters, yeah. Which converts to about 33 to actually up to about 4,500 feet, okay? And so at the higher parts of Boquete, you're at the same altitude as if you're in Denver, Colorado, pretty much. And when you go to higher altitude, your availability of oxygen goes down to breathe in. And that starts to put a stress on your system because the lungs and the heart are all about getting oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. So 
you, the lower the oxygen available, the harder it is to take in. Now, if you have normal lung function, then it's usually not a problem. You may feel a little bit more tired, a little bit more short of breath when you first get here, but your body will compensate by starting to produce more red blood cells, and over a course of two to three weeks, you'll start to feel better, okay? Yeah, the other symptom that you have is you have a tendency to sleep a lot when you first get to a higher altitude. So all of those things, tired, sleep a lot, feeling short of breath when you're, you're walking up in, uh, a hill in particular, that can just be related to a change in the altitude. If it persists, then you need to get to see a doctor. Or if the symptoms get really di difficult for you, if it's very difficult to breathe, even if you stop, that may mean that you've got an underlying problem that needs to get seen right away. So if you're walking and you get short of breath, you stop, you recover fairly quickly, then it's probably related just to the altitude. If not, something else can be going on. The other problem with altitude is that it puts a, a stress on the heart. So as uh, you're breathing here and your heart's working harder to circulate, if the heart has a problem already, like uh, partial vessel obstruction in the coronary arteries or just some sort of cardiac myopathy, which can be, so it's kind of borderline. Then what happens is, is that the heart starts to decompensate with the change in altitude. The shortness of breath will be a consideration of that, but you also need to be aware of the other symptoms that Leslie talked about of a heart attack because you could be having a heart attack. And, and it's just because of the change of altitude. Body's more stressed, puts more stress on the heart, and it starts to decompensate. Uh, choking, Leslie talked about if you get something stuck in your airway, of course, um, and the Heimlich maneuver which is um, something we should all be aware of. Uh, it, and there are, are, if you Google Heimlich Maneuver on, uh, in Google, it shows you the technique. It's a fairly easy technique. But it's absolutely critical to have that to help yourself or a partner out if you get a total obstruction of the airway. If you have a partial obstruction, you just Continue to try to take slow, deep breath in and cough to try to clear it out, to keep trying to clear the airway out. Um, you can also just have water go down the wrong way, right? When that happens, you'll get a laryngeal spasm, which means that the throat closes off and you'll not only get a wheezing sound when you breathe out, but you'll get one when you breathe in. So it's kind of <gasps> sort of thing. And you, you have to realize that it's, this is just a temporary sort of change that's going on. But, uh, but you need to rest, sit down right away, try to breathe as slowly as you can, even though your lungs might be struggling. But if you, if you suck in really hard, the airway's gonna close even more. The larynx is gonna close down even more. So just taking a slow breath in, usually through your nose, because it, it makes it slower for you breathing in. And then breathe out through pursed lips, blowing out like that, because that helps to keep the larynx open as well. And usually within five to 10 minutes, that will go away and gets better. So we talked about the cardiac problems. And Leslie mentioned diabetes and high blood sugar. That can also be in a, uh, an indication of that is very rapid breathing. So you, 
you are uh, feeling like you're very short of breath. And that's not caused because you don't have enough oxygen or you're not getting rid of enough carbon dioxide. It's because you have ketones from the diabetes. And what that does is it lowers the pH of your blood and you become acidotic. And with acidosis, the first trigger is to try to breathe more to clear carbon dioxide out of your system. So another sign of uh, with somebody who has diabetes and they have high blood sugar is that they could be breathing really fast, really hard. And that can help you to figure out, ooh, maybe giving them sugar isn't the right thing. Maybe I need to get them to the doctor right away. The last thing is uh, emotions. Emotions affect our breathing. And if you're, you're faced with a lot of changes that go on here and coming to new country, new city, new housing, new stores, new language, all of that will cause anxiety. And the first sign of anxiety is breathing. You start to breathe faster. So just be aware that are things bothering me? You know, do I feel short of breath? But is that because things are bothering me? And if they are, then be kind to yourself. Give yourself some space and um, sit down, take a rest, uh, have a, a good drink, and relax. Okay, that pretty much covers the medical section that we're going to talk about. And I, I realize I flew through the medical. But again, if something, if you recognize any of those symptoms, get to a doctor as quickly as possible. That's the best thing you can do. Any questions? Any? Yes. Um, I've always heard that y you could like chew up three or four aspirin if you thought you were having a heart attack or stroke. In addition to the cayenne pepper, is aspirin still a good? Um... Aspirin is, is a good thing. It, it's not an anticoagulant. It, well, it is. It's, it's an anticoagulant in that it will prevent blood from clotting. It will not break away any clots. It's also good for pain. If you give it now, it's going to take it still 20 minutes to actually start working. What you're getting a jump on by giving a baby aspirin is you're getting a jump on what the ER is going to do for you. It's a good thing to do. It's not But it doesn't break up an existing clot that you're suffering from right then. Right. Ah. It will prevent future clots from... Well, that's not going to do any good. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, we're going to move on to trauma. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk to you briefly about just falls and fall prevention. Uh, and I'll cover this topic in a future discussion on, uh, through Bocchetti Health and Hospice on falls in general. But just, uh, this is a little falls uh, test to take. And I'm going to read through these very quickly and just score yourself on this. Okay, so the first two questions, if you answer yes, give yourself a two. Have you fallen in the past year? Are you using a cane or a walker to get around safely? If you've answered yes to either one of those, you get a two. The rest of these, you score yourself with a one. Sometimes I feel unsteady when I'm walking. I steady myself by holding on to furniture when I walk at home. I'm worried about falling. I need to push my hands to stand up from a chair. I have some trouble stepping up onto a curb. <laughs> In Boquete, that's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> all right, yeah, you all got a one on that one, I do. I often have to rush to the toilet. I've lost some feeling in my feet. I take medicine that sometimes makes me feel lightheaded or more tired than usual. I take medicines that help me sleep or improve my mood. 
I often feel sad or depressed. So if you answered enough to have four points or more, then that means that you are at risk for having a fall. So what we want to talk about just briefly is what are some of the things that you can do to help you to protect against a fall? Uh, the first thing is take care of your home. Most falls occur actually in the home. So the things that you can do is make sure that you have clear passageways going throughout the house, okay? So get the clutter out of the way, get things so that when you're walking, particularly if it's darker, that you have a clear passageway. Rugs. If you have rugs, have something that will keep them from slipping, particularly in your bathroom, because is the, one of the most difficult things is getting in and out of the shower here. And um, if you have a rug right in front of the shower, it can be very easy for you to slip and fall that way. Um, lighting is another thing. So if at night, do you have night lights? Uh, Mandarin, by the way, sells them. It's one of the few places I found you get lots of night lights if you want them. But have them, have them in the bathrooms. Have them around in the, the walking areas so that when you get up at night, you, you're not doing this. You can immediately have some sort of a vision of where you need to go and to get around. Uh, if you have steps, make sure that they're swept and kept clean, coming in and going out of the house. In the kitchen, try to avoid anything where you're going to need a step stool to get up high. So in, in a lot of the Boquete kitchens, you've got that really high cabinet space. Keep very frequently in use things up there, okay? So you're avoiding as much as possible getting out the ladder, taking, stepping up, and going up. Uh, if you need a step ladder, it's best to get the kind that are a three-step and have an arched handle in it, and then only use the first two steps. You get up on the third, then you're really kind of balancing. So, um, so just plan how, how you have things laid out in the house. Then as you go out and you go around the town, be aware of where you park because if you park on an angle, it's going to be more difficult getting out of the car. You have a higher chance of falling. Uh, if you park so that the person with you has to get into one of the gutters that we've got over here, good chance they're going to fall. Uh, sidewalks, we've had several people with broken hips in Boquete because of the sidewalks. And just being in a hurry and rushing around. So take your time, be observant, stay present, and walk slowly as you're cruising the wonderful city of Boquete or anywhere else out on the trails. So we will cover this more uh, in the Falls Prevention Program. Look for that coming up in the next month or so. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, just one other thing. Uh, it just occurred to me with the lighting in the home. How many people have lost power in the last few days? <laughs> if it happens at night, you're not going to have the night lights. It, you might want to consider investing in an emergency light. They're bright, but they come on. They're battery powered. They're charging when there's power, but when the power comes off, they'll come on and it will give you enough light to see what's going on. Um, just, just a quick thing on that. The other thing I'd like to bring up is um, we have produced a Being Prepared in Boquete for Life and Death guide. Two weeks from today will be a presentation on this to help you fill out the pages and make final arrangements. Right now, 
the program is fully booked. And I believe last I heard there were 10 people on the waiting list. Yes? This, will be, this program will be in two weeks here, the 18th. But the, the, it's fully booked at this point. But if you're interested, go on to the reservation website for the Boquete Chats and get your name on the list. If enough people sign up, I'm sure they'll do it again. The other thing in the back, this, this book is great. It gives you what to do in an emergency when someone is sick or dying and how to handle the official paperwork and what to do in what order. But in the back of it, great, so it's not in the back, um, is a page where you can put medical information so that when something happens to your loved one, you don't have to worry. What medicines is he on? When was the last time he saw the doctor? What are his medical conditions? This kind of information is critical for the doctor in a medical emergency. So having this written down on the fridge is a, is a great place to keep important information so when you're panicking, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, we're going to talk about bleeding. There's three types of, of bleeding. There's the fall down, scrape your wrist, you've got it sort of oozing. That's not bad bleeding. You can wipe it off, you can clean it off, you can put a Band-Aid on it, go on your way, everything's fine. Then there's venous bleeding. That is a deeper cut. It will be continual bleeding and very, very hard to stop. But it's not bright red blood and it's not spurting. If it's a continual seep, then this is something you need to take care of, but it's not going to be immediately life-threatening. If the blood is bright red, it's spurting, that's arterial, that is life-threatening. Best thing to do on that, grab a washcloth. Grab a sheet, as long as it's clean. Grab a uh, clean gauze. Press on it and keep that pressure Keep that pressure on continuously. Do not let it off. If the blood seeps through, put another one on it. You can keep putting on. You pull it off, anything that started to clot will be pulled off with the, the thing you're pulling off. Keep it on. If it's still bleeding and you cannot get any kind of control on it, you can do one of two things. You can do a tourniquet. This happens to be one that was bought um, for a military situation with long Velcro. Hello. Get it on. Run it through the white tab. Twist the windlass. It's going to stop the bleeding. Do not ever take it off. I know in movies it says leave it on for 20 minutes, take it off, or they'll lose an arm or a leg or what have you. No, you want to keep it from bleeding again, so just keep the blood on. But make a note somewhere on the tab, on a piece of paper you stick in their shirt, whatever, when you put the, the tourniquet on. Now, you don't have one of these at home. What do you do? A belt, a tie, a, par a sheet, anything that is not going to actually dig into the, the skin. So you don't want to put a piece of string. You don't want to put a piece of twine. The wider the thing, the better. But you want to keep that bleeding under control. I'm going to end up dropping this. Um, once you've got the bleeding under control, get to a doctor. This person's going to need stitches. Try, if, it's, if you come on someone and they've fallen in the street, try and estimate how long they've been bleeding, and how much they might have lost. If you can get them to the doctor, they'll want to know. It just makes life a whole lot easier. <sighs> Once someone's bleeding, you want to then immobilize the arm. If, some, if I cut my, my wrist, not intentionally, and I've got 
a tourniquet on and I've got compression going on. I don't want to move that arm. So I'm going to want to use the body as a, a splint, if you will. Use a sheet, use a towel, anything to keep it from moving. The less the person moves around, the better it will be. So what color is arterial? Bright red. What color is venous? Okay. So who would like to be splinted? Let me just, anyone want to be a, a guinea pig? Come on up. Uh, I'm going to take it off if you come up with it. Okay, this tourniquet also has the word time on it to remind me that um, w when to do it. So I'm going to put it on her, tighten it as much as I can by hand. I'm going to swing it around so they can see better. Bring it back. Above the bleeding point, yes. Okay, oh, I'm just gonna. And I'm gonna tighten it, and it's, it's gonna hurt. Can you feel it tightening? Mm -hmm. It's gonna hurt, but rather have a sore arm and a bruise or dead? Okay, now, I don't have a tourniquet at home. I cut this off my favorite sheet at home. I'll go around her. Tie a short knot. And then I'll pick up some straight edge I happen to have. And again, I'll tighten it. Same process. What I'm doing is trying to control the blood flow into the arm. So sheets are a wonderful tool to have at home. You all have sheets, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Sure. So if we then move from bleed, any questions on bleeding? Okay. If we move from bleeding to burns, hot water burns, you're, you're boiling water and you dump some pasta in it and it splashes and you've got burns, not a big deal. You've got a cookie sheet you're taking out of the oven. Hello. <laughs> uh, and you happen to hit the edge of the stove. It's not a major burn. It's, this, it's a superficial burn. It's like a sunburn. If the burn goes deeper, like it's an oil burn that goes down partial thickness of the skin, that's going to blister. It's going to turn bright red, and it's going to hurt like crazy. These are the most painful burns. They're not the most serious, but they're the most painful. And let me... Okay, a sunburn, not a big deal. Partial thickness burn, painful, any, you know, th this, is, this is the ones where, where you're going to be crying because it hurts so much. And then a full thickness burn that goes all the way down to the, to the, the nerves, to the bones, that's not as painful because the nerves have all been burned. But it's the, those are the ones that are actually going to end up being life-threatening because you've exposed more of the interior of the body and there's going to be a lot more chances of dehydration and infection setting in. So, minor burns are not, not a big deal. Major burn, what you need to do is stop the burning. Do not put 
burn cream on it. You don't put anything other than cool water. Don't put ice on it. You, the, the skin's already damaged. Ice will create more of a damage to it. So you want to cover it up. You want to protect it. Take off jewelry. You burn your, your, your body and it's going to swell because the body's going to send all sorts of fluids to that area to try and protect it. Hence the, the, the blisters. You've got rings on, you've got bracelets on. It's going to constrict the body and you could end up seriously losing the finger. What the hospital will do is cut off the ring or cut off the bracelet. So if someone burns, gets burned, take off any and all jewelry and any tight uh, clothing. Elevate the burned area. What, what I just said was the um, body's going to send a lot of fluid to the burned area. If you raise it, it's going to control some of that swelling. And watch the breathing. Someone who's burned is going to be panicking, especially second and third degree burns. They're going to be very worried and very upset. Try and calm them down. This is going to be a case where the uh, shortness of breath is going to kick in. But keep them, try and keep them calm. Try and keep them cool. Minor burns. Cover it. Don't break the blister. The, blister, the body's there to take care of itself. Let, let the blister be there. Keep it dry. Keep it clean. Keep it cool. Bandage it. And if necessary, take uh, Advil, Aleve, Tylenol, anything to keep the, the temperature down and, and to help with the pain. Be aware, though, that if there is burning, there may also be other trauma and bleeding may be in, involved. Aspirin, Tylenol, Aleve, any of those are all, uh, they're, they're going to make you bleed easier. So use common sense with that. Okay, fractures. Okay, how many of you have fallen and ever broken a bone? Okay, what did it feel like? It hurts. There's a lot of nerves involved in bones. There's also a lot of bleeding. When you break a bone, all of the blood vessels in the bone are going to start bleeding. Two places in your body can actually create life-threatening bleeding from a broken bone. The hip and the femur. Both of those you can bleed out in two and a half hours. So if you suspect a broken hip, you suspect a broken thigh, you need to get to a doctor immediately. Splint it, immobilize it, control any kind of external bleeding that's going on, get them, call an ambulance, call a person with a flatbed truck that's next to you, anything you can do to get them to the doctor as soon as possible. With a broken bone, any kind of movement, any kind of pressure is extremely painful. So you want to try and immobilize it. Can I have another volunteer? Okay, can I get you again up here? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, your name is? Gay. Gay. She falls out on the, on the street in front of my house. I notice when I go out there, her arm is deformed. It's, it's not straight. It's not normal. It's cold because there possibly might be a uh, interruption of blood flow. So I will make one attempt to straighten it. Now she's going to scream. She is going to be very much aware of the fact that I'm manipulating this break. Ah. If, I, if I can't, <laughs> she's got a high pain threshold. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I can't get it straight in one shot, I stop. I will go in the house. I will find a ruler. I will find a rolling pin. I will find some spoons. 
I will find a branch. I will find a magazine. I will find anything that I can find in order to keep it straight and without movement. I can wrap it with a my, my uh, uh, tourniquet that I've got over there. Pretty much everyone's got, got a, an ace bandage somewhere, and I can wrap it with that. She's got a grip. <laughs> You can use whatever you want. There is no right or wrong. It's what do you have and what can you use in order to keep it sli uh, splinted and still. Now, the one thing you want to make sure is, all right, you splint it above, you splint it and tie it off above and below the, the brake. It doesn't do any good for me to put a splint here if she's broken this, right? Okay, so I've got her splinted. I'm going to move her arm in across her chest, and then I'm going to use a sheet, I'm going to use a towel, I'm going to use duct tape, I'm going to use super glue. But I'm going to do whatever I can to keep this without moving. There's two reasons. One is it's going to be very painful for her every time she moves, and if we drive to town, it's going to be incredibly uh, agonizing for her. But it's also going to keep any further damage from happening. So you can splint an arm, you can splint a leg. What do you do if someone has broken or fallen and landed on their back and you suspect they may have a uh, broken back? What do you do? <laughs> no, you breathe. First of all, you breathe. Thank you, Gay. Um, you don't move them if you can. You don't move them at all. Take a firm grip on the back of their head and their neck to keep their neck from moving because the top seven vertebrae in the, the neck control breathing, motion, uh, touch can be up there too, and heart and brain function. So you want to keep the head still. Call for an ambulance because you don't want to have to move them. The only time you might want to do this is if it's a car accident, the car is going to explode, you need to get them out of the car, do whatever you have to at that particular point. Life before limb. But if you can save both, it's a good idea. How do you call an ambulance in Boquete? That's a very good question. You call, there's, there's a 911 number. Now that you need Spanish for because the 911 center is actually in Panama City and they will then radio here to get the bomberos or the municipal ambulance to go to your location. You can call Dr. Uh, Boya. She's got an ambulance. That's a $250 charge and her husband is a paramedic and they've got someone who will drive and he will sit in the back with you. Um, there is the municipal ambulance and then there's the CSS ambulance. Those you need to have your doctor call or Rodney will call. Or you can then, you can call Dr. Agrizola's office. He's got a 24 hour ambulance. He used to have an office in San Francisco Plaza. That has since closed. He will send an ambulance here, but it's coming from David. <laughs> in a situation like that, you get in the car, you say, fine, I will meet you in Dolega at the Trapel station. If I could just add to this, there was a, a, a lady that fell in front of the apartment where I live, and she was laying on the street, and I came out, and I could tell that she was breathing. She was quiet. The people that came up to talk to her were not moving her, which was good. They called the bomberos. The bomberos were very professional. They, first of all, they put a neck brace on her. Then they log rolled her onto, yeah, shoot, anyway, a stretcher to get her up into the ambulance and that. So they, they treated her very professionally in terms of 
making sure that she was moved safely. And I was very pleased to see that because you never know about the level of training that folks have. But they were very professional here in how they dealt with this problem. That's good to know. Now, you've got someone who's got a dislocated shoulder. You can tell it. It's, you can see the, the dislocation. They're in a dislocation is more painful than a break. They're going to be in severe agony. Do not try and put it in yourself. You're likely to get a, a nerve caught when you get it back inside the socket. Again, keep it totally immobile. Use a sheet, use a towel, use an ace bandage, duct tape, whatever, to keep that from moving. It will help their pain, but any, any movement's gonna, gonna send, them, send them through the wall. Okay, there's two, two types of fractures. There's an open fracture, where the bone is sticking out through the skin, or a closed fracture. The treatment of either is, is the same. Cover it, immobilize it. If you've got an ice pack, use that to help with the swelling and get them to the doctor for an, uh, an x-ray and an evaluation. Here's a listing of phone numbers, the Bomberos, the police, Rodney directs emergency number. You can then write in your, your specific code your doctor. Everyone should have a doctor. Does everyone here have a doctor? I don't care if it's Dr. Diaz, Dr. Gomez, Dr. Tour, you know, Dr. Seuss. As long as so, you, you need to have a doctor here in town. Uh, the problem with the ambulances here in town is, as opposed to most of our home countries is they don't have anyone in the back of the ambulance with you. You will be back there by yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a, a sleeping taxi, if you will. But they'll, they'll get you down to David as quickly as possible. What's, yes? So about, a, I don't know, a couple of years ago, oh, a couple of years ago before, you know, we all got shut down, there was a, 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 um, a pre presentation at BCP um, about an ambulance service from Panama City that was looking at coming to um, Boquete and they had their fancy ambulance out in the parking lot at Tap Out. Um, whatever happened to that? No idea. Pardon? Hmm. I have no idea. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. probably st stuck in Panama City taking care of the emergencies there. <laughs> right. But they were going to station an, an ambulance here permanently in Boquete along with a crew. That'd yeah. be nice, but I haven't yeah. heard or seen anything about that. Right. Okay. What's the first thing you do in an emergency? Breathe. Breathe. And then air, blood goes round and round, air goes in and out, any deviation's not good, fix it. And get help. You're not doctors, you're not nurses, you're not paramedics, you're not EMTs. You're, you're covering for them until a professional can get there but what you can do can save a life. So, I want to have preferably, what time is it? Three volunteers. I want to uh, give you a scenario and I'd like you to give me a general idea on what questions you would ask, what do you think is the main problem, and what would be your first, second, and third actions. Anyone willing to be a volunteer? Chuck, come on up. Now, they have, no one has any idea of what these are. Okay. Chuck, you're eating dinner in a restaurant. Merle is sitting at the table next to you by himself, and he falls to the floor. His head and nose are bleeding heavily from the fall. You don't know the man, and no one else seems to know him either. What would you do? If he wasn't seizuring, I would make sure that he's 
after I take my first breath, I'd make sure that he's a airway, breathing, and circulation are working okay. So A, B, and C. Um, then I'd be looking at his B. I'd be looking at the head injury and seeing where the bleeding is and seeing if it needs compression to stop the bleeding. Um, He's conscious, so you can talk to him. What's that? He's conscious, so you can talk to him. He fell down. Now he's aw he's he's looking at the ceiling, so somewhat aware. Incredible thought. Um, yeah. So I, he's looking aware. So I'd be talking to him, and I'd ask him, "Okay, what is your name?" And he and says, you, "My name is Santa Claus." And he says, "Santa Claus." Mm -hmm. <laughs> Way too young. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, I would be asking him the orientation questions, and then um, the, you may not know what an oh, orientation question is. It's, "Do you know who you are, where you yeah. are, and where and what just happened?" What has happened? And he right. has no clue. And he has no clue. So um, let me see where are we? C D. I, I, assuming that he's breathing, he's not moving around, he's not in any pain, and I'm getting the bleeding under control, I would be asking somebody to call an ambulance and get other support for him, uh, because we don't know why he fell, whether he's diabetic, whether he's, you know, there's a variety of possibilities for what has happened to him. Um, let me see, we see the... Just, just because there's... A through F doesn't mean you've got to fill in all of those. What do you think his problem is? What would be your first guess? Nose and that falls from a chair. Uh, could be diabetes. Could be low blood sugar. Okay. Um, it could be. Uh, Assuming he isn't, again, with nobody there that has any history, I don't know if he's diabetic. I mean, not diabetic, but if he's epileptic or, some, or has had a problem involving awareness like that. Um, okay, what? Could be a stroke, yeah, particularly if his right side's involved and uh, if he's uh, had any uh, choking or anything like that. Anyone else? Oh, that, yeah, I hadn't thought about or, that. <laughs> or if it's fruity, it's He's too high useful. blood sugar. So, yeah, that could be uh, intoxication. Okay. That's, Am I missing anything? His, it, it, the, the general feeling is that this was a diabetic. He hadn't eaten dinner. He'd walk to the restaurant. You, the next question would have been, yes, he, do, he thinks he's Santa Claus, but did you walk here? Have you eaten recently? What, you know, do you have any medical history? Check. Th when there's a medical emergency, all expectations of privacy go away. Have someone watch, check his wallet. Is there something in there that indicates he may have a medical condition? Check his wrists. Is there a diabetic bracelet? You, in addition to solving an, a medical emergency, you're playing detective. What could have happened? Okay? Thank you, Chuck. Next person. Come on. I've used gay twice. There's no right or wrong in this. It, it, it's, listen, it's, it's asking questions. Come on. Gay, <laughs> you can leave your sweater on if you want. Your husband is outside planting flowers mid-morning. You hear a yell and rush out. You find him sitting on a chair complaining of dizziness, nausea, and a blinding headache. He is trembling. He has a cardiac history and is diabetic. He manages his diabetes with diet, no insulin, and the only meds he takes are a baby aspirin. However, last night he had a headache and took two Tylenol. Breath. I'd immediately call an ambulance because it sounds to me like he's probably had a stroke. Okay. 
I'd stay with him till I got there. And if they weren't moving fast enough, actually, I gotta be honest with you, if I could, I'd get him in the car and I would drive him to David. His doctor is Dr. Angisola. I'd call Dr. Angisola's office, I'd tell him I was on the way, I'd tell him that, what had happened, and I'd say, we're coming now. Meet us in emergency, please. And Dr. Angisola would. He's amazing. He would, and he, he, would, he could meet you halfway. He could. With an ambulance, and he, his ambulances always have either a doctor, a nurse, or a paramedic on board, and they're very well trained. Okay, so you, you immediately ruled out cardiac history, and you immediately ruled out diabetes. Why? You're right, you're right. But what, what in this scenario made you ignore those? He's, he's trembling, and if it's my husband, I mean, I, I, I would think the headache would be the, would be the kicker, as, aside from Merle giving me a hint. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be the tip-off. My husband does have a cardiac history, and I did have a similar thing happen about two years ago. At the time, we were in the States, and I knew no one, because I've lived here for 24 years. So all of my support is here. But from what I saw, I, I was concerned that he had had a stroke. So I, and he was undergoing chemo at the time. And I thought, well, it could be something with the medication. But it helps if you know a little bit about what's going on with the other person. The scenario Chuck had, I think, is a lot scarier because you know nothing. You're clueless. You don't know anything about what's going on with them. But in Chuck's scenario, air was going in and out, blood was going round right. and round. It, it was not an immediately apparent life-threatening right. situation. This could be. Yeah. But it could be a combination of things. He could have you know, been working so hard that he's used up all the sugar he had from breakfast. So you know, while he's sitting there, get him a glass right. of juice, grab your purse, get him in the car, and go. It doesn't hurt. You can, ne yes, you can have a high blood sugar situation, but adding a, a glass of juice or a candy or a Coke or whatever isn't going to make it appreciably worse. Mm -hmm. If it's low blood sugar, it will make it better. So never be afraid to give something to someone that you suspect it might be in a diabetic emergency. Okay. All right. You did good. Thank you. Sure. Now, anyone else? Okay, Merle, I'm going to draft you. I'm drafted. You're eating in a restaurant. Someone entering trips and falls. You notice that one leg is rotated and shorter than the other. What do you do? Well, I would, uh, uh, first of all, uh, just check the, the place where the shorter leg is and uh, I'd be concerned about uh, the hip fall and uh, broken hip in that particular case. Stand so, up. stand up. Oh, stand up. <laughs> Move over. They want you in the, so, in the video. So, you know, I'd look to immobilize and to uh, position them so that they're as comfortable as possible, but, you know, log roll them or do, or do whatever. And, um, uh, of course, call for help right away. Do you think it's a dislocation, or do you think it's a broken hip or femur? With one being shorter than the other, it's probably a dislocation. But in that case. So there's not going to be the fear at that point of bleeding to death, but the pain is going to be intense. So if you, if you can, straighten the leg. You may not be able to. Use it. He's in a restaurant. Use a tablecloth. Use use a towel. Use a belt to use the other leg as a splint to keep it from moving. So you can you can help with the pain that way. Any any motion is going to be incredibly painful. Most traumas are. And then the last one I've got is you're driving to town when the car in front of you fails to negotiate a turn, and rolls down the hill. The car is rolled over and is back on its wheels, so it is stable. 
The person inside is unconscious, bleeding, and not breathing. What is the first thing you do? Breathe. <laughs> because this is one where you will tend to go, oh my God, what do I do? Get help. Call the police, get help, have, flag down another motorist. Someone stabilizes the head, get them out of the car. You don't know that car is not going to explode. Get them out of the car, onto the ground. That person who's holding the head keeps it stable. They're not breathing. CPR, it, unless they're, depending on where they're bleeding from, if they're bleeding from a traumatic chest wound, doing CPR is not going to do any good because the blood's just going to pump right out of them. But check and see if they've got a pulse. Check and see if they've got airway. He's not breathing. So CPR is about the only thing you could do. The blood has enough oxygen in it to do CPR for about 15 minutes. When, when you take a breath, it takes about eight or nine minutes for that air to go all the way through the cycle and go back to your lungs for you to exhale it. So doing compressions is better than nothing. The person, for all intents and purposes, is already dead. They're not breathing. You can't make the situation worse. So if you can do something, do it. How many of you have taken the CPR course? Wonderful! We aren't running it yet because we don't feel it's safe enough for the class members to do it, but we're hoping to get it started maybe July-ish. But if we do, we'll, we'll, we'll run it again. Okay, if you need a situation where you need one of the pieces of equipment that Boquete Health and Hospice can provide, a hospital bed, a wheelchair, crutches, walker, Kane, give us give our administrator a call. If you need blood, if you're a Boquete and our service area resident, when we do our blood drives, you automatically become eligible for blood at the hospital so you don't have to call your friends to come down and donate for you. So call our bloodline or have one of your friends call our bloodline. Yes? Is there an Yes, 65. We will be doing a blood drive March 6th from 7 until noon at the Anamalis building. You need to, the minimum you need to be is 65 and you need to have been in country for six months. There are three other pages of qualifications, but those two will, will keep you from donating immediately. If you cannot donate, Boquete Health and Hospice is running a matching fund program where you can offer to match for every pint of blood donated, you could donate a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred, whatever you want to do, up to a specific limit if that's all you want to do. But we're we're doing that starting March or we're doing it on March sixth and again on June twelfth. And we're hoping to get forty five pints of blood. So if you know anyone that could donate, please have them call our bloodline. And if you would like to make a donation, for Boquete Health and Hospice. On our website, we accept PayPal donations. And you can get, if you donate on the PayPal, $5, you can get a PDF version of the Being Prepared Guide. And if you want a hard copy, we've got some for sale out front, or you can get it from the Tuesday Market, or you can get it at MBE. Any other questions? I had uh, one last thing I'd just like to mention, and that is, um, so it's after hours. How do you get medical help? You, you'd call Rodney to see what's available. So being a member of Rodney Direct can be helpful. Um, who has a doctor? Okay. Sure. So do you know what the procedure is there to try to get a hold of somebody? So ask. And it changes. So 
it's good to ask and to know. So know what your doctor will and won't do in terms of helping you out after hours in that regard. And then do you both or do you know where the Clinica de Salud is? That's, that's the one that's closest to Romero's before you get to the shopping down there. It's right on the corner and across from the municipal building. And then the Polyclinica, which is across from the Bomberos, where the, the fire station is, they're there. Boquete provides 24 hour a day emergency services. They alternate between those two, but you can go to one or the other and you can get treated. And they don't care if you're gringos or, or Panamanians, they take you and they, they do a very good job with you. So it's good to know what to do after hours because sometimes you need to get help before just driving down to Dabid to go to one of the hospitals. Thank you very much, everybody.